Um, so I'm Suzette and I'm trained as an architect. I finished my master's in 2016. Um, since that, I practiced as an architect. I used to work for Fieldworks Design Group, mostly specializing in affordable rental housing um, in Joburg CBD. But then alongside that, I started working for a nonprofit called One to One. Um, One to One is an agency of engagement. We practice social, technical, spatial design and support. We work with informal settlement communities and people living in, um, in, in occupied buildings in the inner city. Um, and our goal is to provide technical support to people who are advocating for their own housing rights. So that sometimes means design, it sometimes means construction, it sometimes means meetings, and there's also a fair amount of research and advocacy and teaching that take place as well. Okay, thank you for that introduction. So um, the theme of our exhibition is public interest design. and um, We'd like to know more, you know, what are the challenges that you experience in your day-to-day -day bailers in terms of public, in, public interest initiatives um, and especially within the communities that you engage with? Uh, what are uh, more the, like the hurdles or the challenges every day? Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this question. I think it's quite a tricky one to ask because I think the idea of public interest design is potentially quite broad. Isn't all design in the public interest? Um, so I think the, I think if I was to say our biggest or the biggest challenge that is sort of adjacent to the work that we do, it's the fact that um, a lot of projects, sort of government instigated projects, so public projects, um, undergo a tender process, if you would, um, where consultants are employed as a result of a tender process. And I think that there is a major flaw in how the brief is determined. So tender documentation calls for a certain number of criteria that must be met in terms of the experience of the people applying, the type of work that they do. But there's very little about the quality of the work. There's very little about sort of the interests and those kinds of things I think are lost um, and a lot of it ends up coming down to the cost. So yeah that to me is the problem and also often I think that these tenders and briefs for public interest design ask the wrong questions. They negate the architect's ability to diagnose the problem and someone else has already said well this is the problem that would be the same as a client coming to you and saying i have this plot please design me a house and you saying actually you don't need a house you need uh something else but i think the the problem comes in and that's where you get this mismatch between spaces that are designed for the public that don't necessarily speak to what they need to be because the way the question is asked is problematic yes i've been getting a lot of commentary like that about the briefs not really understanding what the needs are. Sometimes it's a really basic need, sometimes it's most intricate. And some, some people have said an architect should be part of the whole process from beginning to end, writing the brief, selecting the site and so on, which is, would maybe be, be so in an ideal world, but as an architect, how would you position yourself in a way that you can be more influential, influential in terms of a brief. I don't know if you've thought about something like that, like how can we enhance our way of the business of, of the business of architecture, of lobbying, of networking, of being part of the, the whole process and not just receive the brief. Yeah, I think I think there are certain mechanisms that are already in place and things that can be put in place. If you think about the idea of like public private partnerships um i definitely think there's a lot of merit in that so for example the johannesburg development agency a while ago for a couple of years ran a campaign called our city our block or something like that and the point was that existing partnerships or organizations or new ones can form around ideas and actually propose projects to government and then government has you know where where it's sort of like a more grassroots kind of instigation of these processes 
And I think that that is why it's so important for um, architects, but all spatial designers to be, in, if this is something that they're concerned with, to be engaged in the spaces that they care about these kinds of things. So if you think about how during COVID, there was this massive like upheaval of community action networks. Um, and, and so I've joined the Joburg Inner City Can, um, and it's really cool. Suddenly, if you're a part of these conversations around issues outside of architecture, you start being present when architectural or spatial issues come about. Um, and it's a matter of being in the right place at the right time. And those kinds of things through the correct mechanisms and streams, um, things like public-private partnerships, uh, those things start becoming incredibly useful. And then I think the other way that that can be done is through academia. I think that academia is a excellent avenue for developing new ideas and really incubating pro projects that typically the private sector, because the private sector can only work if it is funded, where the way academia is funded is it's research funding. It's, it's funding with an open-ended question where private sector funding is funding where there is a very specific product in mind. And I think that if we're creative with the way that we approach academic funding, but also with our understanding of what research is, I think the, the concern is that academics typically see research as a very controlled thing where there is a literature review and they do a bunch of research, they develop some ideas and they write something and then they publish something. I think that if we start broadening our understanding of research to include action research and design research, research through design, where there's experimentation that is a process of developing new ideas, then you're sort of achieving two things at the same time. And that, that the, the deeper understanding that you get through doing research, rigorous research, academic research, um, then means that the type of projects that you conceive are also a lot better um, developed and more well-rounded. Um, and then that can be taken further. Okay, so going from academia to research and now to actually working with different firms and so on, have you experienced a lot of your own thoughts being changed or your ideas or your uh, you know, perceptions of certain ways of how we engage and do workshops from, uh, from academic to a professional? Has you, have you had any? 100%. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think typically in, so if I speak about like my experience as an academic, that's my experience sort of in my postgraduate studies. I mean, we read all the books which teach us some basic fundamentals and then we, we go into the world and especially when you're studying like a traditional architecture education affords you very little time to engage with people. So your understanding is quite narrow. Um, and then practicing sort of being on the ground for these last couple of years, none of those experiences really taught me exactly how complex and nuanced this process really is. So then my most recent experience last year was working on the ground, um, physically being involved in renovation processes of occupied buildings, working with people every single day. And the number of challenges that came about were so complex. Um, but at the same time, they were quite simple. It's the idea of, of working with other people. When you're doing a group assignment where all five of you come from similar backgrounds, that is complex enough as it is. Now imagine that where you're working with 40 or 50 people and everyone comes from different environments and what they have in common is so different to where you come from. So I think a lot of what I learned is that no amount of sort of reading or thinking or arguing about these things can stand in for just like basic understandings or willingness to understand other people. I and mean, I think that that willingness to understand people comes in to play not just when working on the ground with um, communities in need of support, but also when working, because we often engage with government. And I think the process of engaging with government is not much different. It's about understanding that other people are people and you are a person and relating to their humanity. Um, and even when teaching, so I've, I've been fortunate enough to teach students and to teach um, professionals as well. 
as soon as you can adopt that attitude that everybody is a human with a story and their story is complex and you can engage with people in a manner that takes that into account, um, you can be far more successful. And that's no academ academic research is going to teach you that. Yes, so, the, you know, one of the last questions we all, well, I always ask is, um, how would you like to see the role of the architect or the designer evolve? But more, how would you say should the idea of design education and um, education and architecture, what would you say if you, how, how can we change our way of, of not just, you know, being book, get, book engaged the whole time, um, like what would you suggest we change or enforce in our system of upbringing? I think I, I could get a lot of flack for this, but uh, I think that architects are incredibly precious about architecture. Um, and, and it's something that's ingrained in architectural education across the board from the moment you walk into architecture school. Um, and I think that design is an incredibly valuable asset in the world and that if we're going to get anywhere, we're probably going to have to design our way out of it. But um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's this, the perpetual ego and arrogance of the architect needs to be abandoned. I think you need to understand yourself as one part of a very complex thing, an important part, but not the only part. Um, and, and if we start doing that and we understand that other parts of the process at different times are incredibly important, and that at all times it's about that idea of justice and allowing, allowing multiple voices to be part of the conversation, then not only does the architect step back a bit and not overshadow everything, but also you possibly will come up with far richer design solutions if you just uh, you know, start taking other people's stories into account. Mm -hmm. So when you say being less precious about architecture, do you mean just by your physical ability to design um, or your, you, your, your ideas and your concepts? Is that what you um, refer to when you say being more, less precious about architecture? Yeah, I think so. I think, I think our idea that architecture is an object that comes out of a design process is, I mean, it's, it's valid, but architecture and design is the process. Um, and if architects are first and foremost designers, they can understand that the entire process from start to finish from sort of encountering the problem and being able to empathize with everyone who is a part of the situation. Um, and then developing ideas and this constant feedback where you're having an understanding of people, having an understanding of the problem and then using your skill and your talent to design, that is design. It's not, it's not just about the final product. And I think often architects, and it's, I mean, it's the, it's the nature of the beast. Capitalism tells us we need to do as much work in as little time as possible so that we can get maximum output for it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think perhaps even the way that we, we pay for architecture, we should pay more for the process and less for the product. And then the pr process can be given more importance. Um, because, yeah, if you, if you can really get involved in the process and you can let the process do what it needs to do, the result might end up being less architecture, but definitely not less design. Well, that's a very valuable statement that you just made, like architecture is the process. And thank you so much for all your input and all your, <laughs> on your thoughts on this. It's not a problem. Um, I will definitely send you like the link when we're, when we're done with all the videos and all the recordings. And it's very interesting, like all the people that I've managed to, to have in a, a conversation with all the outcomes. And most of them actually say the same thing, which is, you know, mm. I think a platform maybe like YouTube or even a website is a good place to show actually where, you know, where in the system are we not, we need to, you know, put it, give our attention to more or change the way and enforce yeah. the way we think about architecture school, especially. Um, yeah, no, definitely. And I think the world that we live in is a systemic place as in, everything sort of influences other things. 
Um, and if you think about like traditional systems thinking, you always need to ask the question about like going further up the line. Um, and we're all very critical of architecture as an industry and the construction industry as a whole, but possibly it's because we're too far down the line where we're dealing with the problem. And I think that that's why it's, it's, it's so valuable and that's why I think it's always important for me to give my time to academia and to be involved in teaching and those kinds of things. Because I think if we can start addressing these issues further up the river, then we'll have more people who see architecture and the construction industry different down the line. Mm.